Well, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. We like to go through books of the Bible. You know, um, we, before Hebrews, we went through the book of Romans. We're almost finished now with the book of Hebrews. Pray for me because I think we'll do, we'll do something, of course, in the Hebrew scriptures here in, um, in the weeks ahead. Uh, we only have two more chapters to go. It's been an awesome study. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love the book of Hebrews. Amen? And what better book to study for a Messianic congregation, right, than the book of Hebrews? Of course, it's natural. So turn with me to chapter 12. Now the title of my message, this is the message that the Lord dropped in my heart, all right? Because the first, the first number of uh, verses, it really talks about Yeshua, his amazing ministry and what he did for us. Then it kind of just flows into talking about the Father. And of course, it's really about his whole ministry, his relationship with us. So I'm calling this message, Yeshua and the Father and us. Yeshua the Father and us, or Yeshua the Father and me. All right, praise God. Father, bless your word. Thank you for Yeshua. Thank you, Father, for you. Thank you, Ruach HaKadosh. Thank you for all of us. This is what you're doing. Speak to us this morning in a deeper, in, in, in a very intimate way. In Yeshua's name, amen. 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 So, Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, let's read the first three verses. I like to study and read out of the New American Standard, and I have for my study also the complete Jewish Bible, actually uh, also uh, using that commentary, as well as the Wycliffe Study Bible commentary. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin, which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Yeshua, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And today many, many grow weary and lose heart for various different reasons and what have you. But um, let us uh, take a moment and think about this. Now, what is he talking? We just finished the chapter 11, which is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith, Faith's Hall of Fame. We looked at Abraham, First, even before Abraham, we looked at uh, Abel and uh, also Enoch and Noah, then Abraham, and then um, Isaac and Jacob a little bit, then Moses. It really focused a lot on Abraham and then a lot on Moses and then all the other saints that went before us. And this is what he's speaking of when he says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, all of their testimony has been recorded in these pages of this incredible, holy book that we call the Bible, the book of all books, the immeasurable book. And um, God breathed, divinely inspired, infallible, uh, through human authors, but who were absolutely moved by the Holy Spirit and every Holy Spirit. God oversaw everything through every writer, amen? and their own personalities come through it. And we do not know the author of the book of Hebrews, but I very much believe, as I've shared a couple of times and from the very beginning, I believe that you can sense the hand of Paul all over this letter. And I don't think he was the one that actually wrote it, but I believe that, that he perhaps was the ghost writer. 
and, um, and perhaps uh, Mark authored it, or it could have been someone else. It could have been uh, Silas or Timothy. I'm actually persuaded it might have been Timothy, but uh, who, of course, served with Paul. But the extent of the knowledge of Hebrew and the Hebrew faith and the sacrifices and Levitical priesthood and uh, everything else, it was somebody that had to be very familiar with all of that, the temple worship, the Levitical priesthood, and nobody was more so in that early days of, um, of the Brit Hadashah than Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, who studied at the feet of the famous Rabbi Gamaliel who was a great-great-grandson of uh, one of the most famous rabbis in all of history in Judaism, uh, Halal. You have Gamaliel. So that's just my, and you could see things in Scripture that seem to indicate they're very, they're just very kind of familiar, they're similar to Paul. Anyways, from the very beginning, and you know, I was thinking about this on the ride home. I have a friend that I like to do some kind of little, um, kind of, uh, what would you call um, uh, guide trips with once in a while. My favorite travel partner is Kathy, but once in a while I go and do a little two, three day trip with my friend Dr. Geisler. And he was asking me if I'd be interested in going to like Cooperstown in New York State. It's not that far away, or Canton in Ohio. You know, Cooperstown is the Baseball Hall of Fame, Canton, Ohio, which is closer, is the Football Hall of Fame. And not really interested. When I was a kid, I was interested. But you know what I'm really interested in is the spiritual Hall of Fame. I mean, I loved when I was a kid. I loved Willie Mays. I loved Hank Aaron. I loved Harmon Killebrew. I loved Roberto Clemente. I loved Mickey Mantle. I did. He was my hero. I loved them all. Sandy Koufax didn't pitch on Young Kippur. Oh, what a guy. Right? All right. But you know what? What I'm really interested in is Faith's Hall of Fame. Really, that's who I'm really interested in. And I'm just, you know, one day we don't get just to get their autographs, right? We're actually going to be able to sit down and actually talk to them, amen? And uh, be with them. This is the great cloud of witnesses that surround us, the testimony. And, I'll, you know, let me just say for the gals, here you have the testimony not only of these men, but you have the testimony of Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, right? Miriam, who we call Mary, you know, and uh, so many others, you know. And so you have the testimony of all these men and women. And, um, and um, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us and cheering us on, let us lay aside every encumbrance in the sin which so easily entangles us and run with race, the, with endurance, the race that's set before us. So here, the author, like Paul, because Paul does this in various epistles, he uses a sports analogy. Now, I am a sports fan. Um, I love the Steelers. Everybody who knows me knows that, okay? Good friends with Tun Shilkin before he passed away. And, um, and I just had lunch with a former Indianapolis coat who's a Pittsburgh boy, uh, Leo Wisniewski. He heads up a wonderful ministry called Locking Arms, and they do that um, uh, men's thing every year, you know, man up and all of that. But... Um, you know, I, I, I listen to this sports analogy, and Paul uses a lot of sports analogies, but, but back in ancient days when Olympians would, uh, you know, perform in the Colosseum or wherever else they would perform in the gymnasiums, they would strip down, they would strip down and uh, lay aside Every encumbrance, and this is the analogy, so we could run uh, that race without anything hindering us, without anything weighing us down, and uh, run that race with endurance because, and I'll use a very uh, term of endearment with uh, Yiddish kite, okay, bubby, bubbala, all right? which just means, you know, one who is precious, all right, bubbles, listen, 
All right? We're not running a 50-yard dash. Can I hear an amen? amen? This is not a 50-yard dash. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. It's a long-distance race. Amen? And it's a relay race, too, because we have to hand... The faith was handed off to us by this great cloud of witnesses, and now the torch is in our hands. Amen? The torch is in our hands. And, um, and so we see these sports metaphors to drive home these spiritual principles, and we're all called, listen to me, all of us, I don't care how old you are, I don't care if you're battling with weakness or with different infirmities of the flesh. We are all called to be a spiritual Olympian. We are all called to be a spiritual athlete. And just as you train to be an athlete, just as you train vigorously and rigorously to be an Olympian, all right? You have to, we have to be trained spiritually so we can be spiritually able to be like David who says, I could run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. I remember when I was a young believer, they actually turned that psalm into a song. I could run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's my strength and my shield. He gives power to all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we have to become trained and be like a spiritual athlete, like a spiritual uh, Olympian, if you would, and, uh, and to run this race, which is a marathon. It's not a fast, you know, 50 yard dash. And this is the way that you do it, Bubby. This is the way you do it, saints, all right? You do it by fixing, fixating your eyes upon the one who is the author, the initiator, and the finisher, the one who will complete your faith, Yeshua, our Messiah. Can I get an amen? You take your eyes off of Yeshua, you could be the greatest swimmer that ever was. You could swim, I read just a few days ago, someone was swimming like the entire West Coast, you know, and to Catalina Army and then all uh, uh, Island and then all the way to Oregon and a fog set in and she couldn't finish and she was just miles away and then she did it again and she persevered. And of course they had all sorts of watchers and spotters so there weren't any sharks that got near her. But you know, you could be the greatest swimmer in the world like her, an Olympian, right? Okay, but if you take your eyes off the prize, if you take your eyes off Yeshua, you'll begin to sink, just like Peter. Amen? Amen. Just like Shimon Kifa, Simon Peter. you got to fix your eyes on Yeshua. Not on the competition, oh, let me see who's running next to me, right? Who's, who's swimming next to me. Not on the competition, and not on the toughness of the course. Amen? No, you keep your eyes on the author and the finisher of your faith. Can I hear an amen? amen. Philippians 1 6 says, Let him who began a good work in you bring it to completion. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Amen? amen. So, listen. Then it goes on to say, fixing your eyes on Yeshua, for he's the author and the finisher, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. There's an awful lot of shame in being, you know, just put on a cross without any garments, without any undergarments, you know, for all the world to see beaten to a bloody pulp where he was unrecognizable almost as a human being, as a man, all right? 
But it says there, he did, and it was the most brutal, brutal, shameful way to be put to death. They could not have thought, think of a more shameful way to be put to death than crucifixion. And it says, who, for the joy before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I had to stop and ponder this for a moment, and I thought... For the joy that was set before him, he endured all that. He endured the shame. He endured the humiliation. He endured the harshness, the brutality, the grotesqueness, the ugliness, the, the torture. All right? Why? How? What did he mean by the joy that was set before him? Did you ever ponder that? What was the joy that was set before him? that enabled him to endure torture and extreme, the extreme suffering of the cross. Turn with me, keep your place here in Hebrews 12, and turn with me to Ephesians 5.27. Ephesians 5.27. You're already starting to think, well, what is that joy? This is what I think it is. Hebrews 5.27 27. That he might present to himself the ecclesia, all right, the called out ones, which is what the word church means, in all of her glory, not having a spot or a wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless before him. The joy that was set before him was his vision. This morning I read a proverb every day as well as other scriptures. And it says, without a vision, the people perish. Without a revelation, the people perish. Listen, the vision that was before Yeshua was that one day there would be a spotless bride made up of Jews and Gentiles and people from every tribe and tongue and kindred and clan and nation that would make up his bride and they would stand without, before him without spot, without blemish, in all of her glory. Can I hear an amen? amen? And you, dear ones, are part of that bride. Amen? That was the vision. And that has to be our vision as well. Amen? That has to be part of our vision as well. And uh, consider him, verse 3 says, who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding of blood in your striving against sin. Many lose heart because of the harshness of trials. We've all been through some trials. There's not a one person in here who at one time in your life, maybe multiple times in your life, cried and groaned up to God, say, Lord, I can't take any more. Lord, take me home. And the Lord probably whispered back, not yet. Not done yet. But all of us have been there, amen? Will you feel like you just can't take any more? Well, you've reached the very end of your self, but guess what? At the end of yourself, you'll find an endless Lord, an endless shepherd, amen? Who is moved by the feeling of our infirmities, amen? And ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. And um, Suffering and grief and pain could cause one to lose heart, and many do lose heart. The solution is to consider Yeshua and what he endured for the sake of you and me. It's so important to understand that we need to learn, we need to have in our heart, Father, I want to finish well. Everybody say this prayer with me. Father... I want to finish well. Listen to me. I pray every one of us not only finish, but we finish well. Can I hear an amen?
let us remember that in many parts of the world, in this very hour and in this very day, martyrdom is going on in different parts of Africa, places like Nigeria, all right, and different parts of the Muslim world, you know, North Korea, China, Red China, many other places. There's terrible martyrdom going on in this very moment. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. Now, there's a little transition here and the author then quotes Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11, verse 5, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you in sons, as sons, and let me just say, I, I just, I'm very conscious of this. It's not just sons, but daughters, okay? All right? My son, my daughter, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. And he's quoting Proverbs, Solomon, and Proverbs 3.11. My son, my daughter, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son, daughter, and daughter whom he receives. Listen, the Lord's discipline proves your worth to him. The Lord's discipline proves your value to him. Because you are valuable to him, your soul is valuable to him, it, that is why he disciplines you. That is why he chasteneth you. That is why he corrects you. Otherwise, he wouldn't bother chastening you. Chastening is part of the love relationship that the father has with his children, with his sons and with his daughters. And sometimes we don't understand the father's chastening, but we need to receive it as his love towards us to purify us and make us more like him in character to become partakers of his divine nature. Verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure, for God deals with you as sons and daughters. For what son and daughter is there whom the Father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons or daughters. Whew. If we don't receive this vital aspect, intimate aspect of our Father's dealings with us, we are in danger of disqualifying ourselves as his true sons and daughters. And God forbid that should happen to any one of us. Amen? In uh, rabbinic Judaism, they have a Hebrew word for illegitimate. You know this word, rich, I'm sure. No? Mamza. Have you ever heard of Mamza? No? Okay. We'll discuss it amongst ourselves later. It, the word, Hebrew word mamza means illegitimate son. And it suggests strong contempt. Strong contempt. If you ever heard, hear a Jewish person saying that, that's not, they're not being very nice. All right? Shouldn't say that about anybody, right? If we continue to refuse and reject his discipline, we show that we're not a legitimate son and daughter of his. Furthermore, verse 9, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. 
Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness, his character, his divine nature. Now, when I was growing up, and maybe some of you had fathers like this, um, I didn't really know my real dad. Well, I knew him up until I was very young, and then my parents were divorced and my mom remarried. And my stepdad, neither my real dad or my stepdad, knew how to be really um, a really good you know, parent. They just didn't know. And um, I led my stepdad to the Lord years ago after I came to faith, so I got him back, praise God, amen, in a good way. But um, when he would discipline, it would go way overboard, right? And I was fearful of him. He, I mean, I was fearful of him. And I, to say the least, did not like him. That's not the way our Heavenly Father is. Amen? Our Heavenly Father, he disciplines us so that we can share his very same nature. Amen? His very same nature. And he disciplines us with tremendous tenderness and love. Even sometimes if we don't understand his discipline, I've said this many times, I want you just to write this down or have it somehow in, just firmly embedded in your minds. If you don't understand his hand, trust his heart. Say that with me. If you don't understand his hand, trust his heart. Amen? Because he does it for our eternal good for our eternal good, that we might share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I know some of the most difficult days of my life, I could not understand my father's hand. All right? I, I've had two congregations, and one I only lasted a year. That was a quickie, you know, but it was the one that brought us here to Pittsburgh. <laughs> but thank God, because through that, the Lord had us pioneer Sharesh David, Root of David Messianic Congregation. But then 10 years later, I had to walk away from that congregation, Kathy and I did. And that was so painful. It was so incredibly painful. An organization that I had absolutely loved with everything in me, I, I just uh, couldn't understand. And it took a, a number of years to really heal from that. But you know what? Because of what took place, I have you. There would be no Yeshua ben David in Squirrel Hill if that didn't take place. God knew what he was doing. And I would not be with Chosen People Ministries to this day. I thank God with everything that's within me to be part of such an incredible, wonderful, historic mission to the Jewish people as Chosen People Ministries. It was because of that tremendous, that, that horrific time of testing and uh, chastening and uh, discipline, but from out of it came forth the, some of the greatest blessings of our lives. Now, I would not like to go through chastening like that again, <laughs> but I'm just saying, God knows what he's doing, amen? amen? He knows what he's doing, even when we can't understand it and we, don't un we can't see what he's doing. All discipline for the moment for the present tense, seems not to be joyful, but grievous, sorrowful, but those who allow themselves to be exercised by it, trained by it, will yield later on the peaceable fruit of righteousness. There's always an afterwards 
with the testing and the training of God's people. There's hurt, there's pain, but there's always an afterwards in regards to his disciplining of our lives. Afterwards, it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Verse 12 and 13, listen. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And we need to all of us receive this holy exhortation. Let's just receive this holy exhortation. We need to give proper attention to our true spiritual condition, because if there's anywhere that we are walking wounded, that we feel injured, that we're really feeling the brokenness, the hurt, the pain that we have sustained, we need to give proper attention that it may be healed so we can be whole again and not be permanently, permanently put out of joint. Amen? Permanently dislocated. Amen? Stop and pause for a moment with me as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper here in just a few more minutes. Stop and pause with me for a moment and let us recognize that the one, the, one, the person who's always complaining and kvetching, that there is evidence of a spiritual lameness and a weakness that needs to be corrected and healed. If you are being made whole, if you are being healed, you don't go around kvetching and complaining all the time because that's evidence that you're not being healed. God wants to heal you. Amen? And listen, we're going to go a little bit deeper into this. Make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out the joint, but rather healed. Verse 14, pursue peace with all men and sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. As much as lieth within you, Paul says, and this is very Pauline flavored language here, because he says that, I think it's in Timothy, or I can't remember the verse right offhand. I probably could read the side notes. Where does it say that? Ah, Romans 14, 19. Okay. As much as it lieth within you, be at peace with all men. For through this kind of heart motivation, you will sanctify your soul. I don't care if you're the more wronged party, if you're the more one that injustice has been done to, you leave your gift. If you know your brother is, has an offense against you, you leave your gift at the altar and you go and be reconciled with your brother or your sister because until you do that, something is getting away, getting in the way of you and the Lord. You leave your gift on the altar, you go and you be reconciled. I did that numerous, numerous times when we first came to Pittsburgh, about three, four, five years into it, I had to go back to Minneapolis and meet with like three different couples, all right, and just pour out my heart to them and repent to them, apologize to them. And you know what? After I got done doing it with tears, they immediately began to repent to me with tears and weeping and crying and kissing and hugging. We do a lot of that in the Jewish world, okay? That's just the way we're kind of wired, all right? Then many years, about four years later, I began to try to do that with the folks at Sheresh David, my former congregation, and I began to one by one be reconciled to everybody, and so was Kathy, all right? Kathy even made a a Zoom meeting in, from Pittsburgh to Jerusalem to be healed with someone who is like a spiritual father. Man, kudos on Kathy. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. It was so pure. It was of the Lord. 
even though we felt like we were the more aggrieved party, that it must be five, six years ago now, I can't remember, maybe 2017, Shoresh David, our other Messianic congregation, had us come, 2018, whatever it was, had us come, and they had the whole congregation, and they basically, the spiritual leader said, this is the, these are the founders of Shoresh David. These are the true spiritual father and mother of Shoresh David. You need to receive them. You need to honor them because we're not doing it for their sake. We need to do it for our sake. You need to do it for your sake. And it was just complete and total reconciliation. Now I want to tell you that if we walk in this type of peace, we're called Blessed are the peacemakers. Amen? We call and we have the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. Amen? You will see the Lord. Without which you will not see the Lord. But when you walk in that kind of heart motivation, you will see the Lord. Can I hear an amen? amen. You will see the Lord moving in your own life. You will see the Lord moving in other people's lives. You will see the Lord moving in your family. You will see the Lord moving in your community, your congregation. You will see the Lord. I promise you. Amen? Amen. And then, look at verse 13. 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up causing many to be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright out for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, Father, bless me, bless even me, he said, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance though he sought it with tears. He was crying because it was worldly sorrow, he missed out on his inheritance of being the firstborn. You know, it went to Jacob. Even though Jacob got it in a deceitful way, all right? And he paid for it for doing that. But God still, even though he did it wrongly, his heart motivation was, I want the blessing. I want the blessing. Root of bitterness. I know we, we might go over a few minutes this morning, but listen to me. The root of bitterness brings up and defiles our world every single day until Yeshua comes. It's what contaminates the world all around us. It's what destroys families. It's what destroys marriages. It's what contaminates friendships. It's what contaminates communities. It's what contaminates congregations. It's a cancer. It must be dealt with. It must not be allowed to fester and spread. And then you have the biblical example of Esau. And so we need to root out any root of bitterness. Can I hear an amen? Now, where does bitterness begin? It begins with resentment. You know, I, I really honor the whole uh, recovery movement. It's done so much immense good all over the world. People who won't, wouldn't darken the door doorways of a synagogue or a church or what have you. But God has used it. It came out of the Beatitudes. It came out of the teachings of Yeshua. All right? And they have kind of principles in the recovery movement, 12 steps and what have you, the serenity prayer. But they, they talk about dealing with resentments. I don't know that I've ever gone to a meeting where they didn't talk about resentments. Catch the resentment before it becomes a root of bitterness. Amen? Amen. Don't let the resentments fester into a root of bitterness. So... You know, um, I just pray all the time. You know, even when I, I, I'm not able to somehow meet a person that I may be estranged with, all right? I still, even though it hurts me, uh, like a family member, all right? I still pray, Lord, I forgive them in the name of Yeshua, even if I don't feel like it, even if the feelings aren't there, the emotions aren't there, certainly the circumstances aren't there, I still pray by an act of my will, Father, let your forgiveness for so-and-so flow through me 
and by an act of my will, I just forgive them in the name of Yeshua and trust the feelings, the emotions, the circumstances, all will come later. Amen? Now we're going to get ready to take the Lord's Supper. Yeshua, the Father, and me. Yeshua and the Father and us. Kevin, can you and, and Kathy, can you come forward? And Kevin, come forward. We're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Everybody is invited to take the Lord's Supper. If you know Yeshua, if you know Yeshua, you can take the Lord's Supper. All right? And, um, you know, uh, I would just, um, that's the only prerequisite. All right? That's the only prerequisite. You just have to believe in your heart. You believe in Yeshua. He is your Messiah. He's your Savior. That's the only prerequisite. Don't let a hurt, all right, to prevent you from coming down to this table. And if there's anybody here who can't come forward, you know, raise your hand and we'll have someone bring you the bread and the wine. It is grape juice. We'll turn it into wine. No, I'm just kidding. It's grape juice. And it's matzah, the original communion, unleavened bread. And um, where's Kathy? Oh, there. Okay, thank you. I don't just looked away. All right. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to have you come. The first row comes first. All right. Just take a cup and a piece of matzah. All right. Kevin will You'll, you'll be holding the matzah, you'll break a little piece off, and then just go around the other way, back to your uh, rows, and then the second row, and then the third row, and then we'll all just hold on, and we'll give, we'll give an old King James word, okay? Melech Yaakov word. Tarry ye, all right? Tarry ye just for a moment, we'll all do this together, okay? Let's just worship the Lord, and let's begin. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Father, for healing us from all the hurts, from all the past hurts. Thank you, Father. We forgive siblings. We forgive parents, grandparents. We forgive children. We forgive them all. We forgive them all. Friends, pastors, in the name of Yeshua, Hallelujah. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, they are made white as snow. White as snow. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine what I would look like white as snow. <laughs> Do you know that's why brides wear all white in a wedding, right? That's why, from the Bible. So, But we in his eyes, when we repent, when we ask forgiveness, when we forgive, we're white as snow. Thank you, Lord. Let's just conclude with this uh, worship now from our worship team. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Bless, bless you. Have a wonderful Shabbat. And have a wonderful um, uh, day of the Lord and weekend. Walk, just walk in his mercy. Walk in his love. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.